We welcome everyone and thank you for joining this webinar. Today's webinar will be focusing on practicing safe dentistry in the COVID-19 era. Safety is our greatest priority and this webinar will guide all dental professionals to safely get through this time. I would like to inform you all that you will be receiving a total of two CE credits. You must stay active during the whole session, and at the end of the webinar, a pop-up window of a survey will appear on your screen. If you do not see a pop-up, you will also be receiving an email from GoToWebinar with the survey link an hour after the webinar is ended. You will receive your C certificate by email within 14 business days. As shown on the screen, there will be a question box in the panel board. Please feel free to ask questions in the question box throughout the lecture as the presenter will address them during the live Q&A session after the lecture. Without further ado, I'm honored to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Jin Kim is a 1986 graduate of the dental school at University of Sydney, Australia. He completed specialty training in periodontics at UCLA School of Dentistry in 1998. Dr. Kim is board certified by the American Board of Periodontology and the American Board of Oral Implantology. He has advanced degrees in pathology, public health, oral biology, and had been in general practice in academia for nine years prior to starting his career in periodontology. He has spoken at many national and international meetings worldwide and has researched that has been published in respective scientific journals. He is the co-director of Global Dental Implant Academy. With that, I ask that you give Dr. Jin Kim a warm welcome to this webinar. Hello, everybody. Let me get my slide up and running. Okay, I hope we don't have any technical glitches today. Uh, it's great to uh, get to be in front of uh, all of you guys again. Now, times have changed. Uh, we've been kind of used to this COVID uh, situation and most of us are practicing again. Uh, let's hope that um, you know this thing calms down so we don't get any more interruption in our practice. Okay, all right, let's 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 move on now. So um, <clears throat> this is, um, as of this morning, <clears throat> we are clearly at a place where <clears throat> uh, the, the control of the virus is not anywhere near what we desire. Uh, you know, this is a black slide, literally. Uh, it's actually the number of people dead. Uh, deaths reported in the state of California. I presume there are many uh, attendees who are from California, so I just wanted to share this. But this is a common scene throughout the United States today. A uh, part of my lecture is uh, somewhat of a repeat from May 14th. On May 14th, I actually gave a similar presentation, a little bit more longer, and because it was more introduction back then, uh, you can actually find this on my website if you would like to refer back to some of the older material. So today, now that we have most of our dental practices, both in California, throughout the US, and perhaps even globally, have been in some form of practice, some form of uh, return to normalcy for the past month or so. Uh, let's try to review where we are. Uh, let's try to get some feedback as to what's going on and so forth. I'm sure many people uh, sympathize with this or can relate to this, except this person is not your doctor, is a hairdresser, because everybody is walking around. Uh, sometimes in supermarkets, you see some people who are wearing gloves and whatnot. And then we see the other extreme, people who don't really care, people who don't buy into this, people that do not wear masks even, make, make it out of a political issue, which I truly do not understand. Uh, some reference that you may want to refer to is in this excellent uh, referral. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Leslie Fang's, uh, Dr. Leslie Fang's um, you know, cheat sheets, as he calls it. You can become a member and you can find a lot of relevant information. Uh, some of the material does come from there, but I do want to state that this is my, today's presentation is pretty much my own perspective and my own guidance, nothing official about Global Dental Implant Academy or Dentist USA for that matter. It's really up to you individuals to take this information and use it uh, in the way that you see fit. Now, just a quick review of some of the basics. These are the three uh, graphs you want to understand. Earlier on, we talked about flattening the curve. The flattening of the curve is really what's referred to on the top plateau and then going down. 
So, you know, as the cases went up earlier on, we had really no idea, you know, it was called the novel uh, virus, of course, we have not experienced it. And then we flattened, the curve was not going uh, higher anymore, and then it had to go down. The key indicator, of course, was it had to go down continuously for 14 days. Now, the interesting thing is that is what the public health uh, experts uh, indicate and tell us. That is the indication for us to return to normalcy, for instance, reopening of dental practices, reopening of bars, hair salons, and gyms and whatnot, should have followed this. Unfortunately, many of the states in the United States did not do that. California included. We were premature in getting into uh, normalcy for many different reasons, and we're in trouble. This is a month, uh, two months ago, May 14th. Some of the countries that had fared fairly well, and you can see uh, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, people have heard a lot about that in the news. And then there were countries that did sort of okay. Uh, Italy, uh, as we all know, were in, was in trouble at one point. Even Germany, some of the strongest nations around the world, were struggling. Uh, and then there were countries who were just completely not in control. Uh, and you can see the red graphs uh, and included in there were USA, United Kingdom, and so on. Sweden, the one that did some uh, literally um, deadly experiments uh, that did not turn out very well as we know today. Now, California, right before we started to go back to work was exactly this portion. Arizona was even by May 15th, May, uh, Arizona opened in May 1st. And some of these other states that you see, none of the United States uh, states had things under control when we basically opened. And it is no surprise that we are in this uh, situation as of today, where the curve seemed to plateau, seemed to go down, and all of a sudden is surging in a deadly deadly way. So this is how things are presenting as of this morning, a uh, number of new cases that's rising, which is virtually all populated areas. And today, now that we look back, Italy, the one country that had tremendous amount of suffering, and Spain for that matter, and the UK has somewhat controlled it, and we are down to the baseline. Mexico has not. Uh, it's, it's troubling. Brazil is extremely troubling. Even their president has uh, tested positive, not wearing masks. Uh, our other neighbor, Canada, has done fairly well. So this is where we are today. Um, and if we, you know, compare where things are, some of the good countries, uh, the greens versus the yellow, which is doing fairly well, and then India, Brazil, U.S. is literally completely out of control. Some of the green, this is as of this morning, are the countries that have done excellent. All of these countries, you know, really deserve pat on the back and, uh, uh, you know, recognition. These countries can do better, but notice China is on that list. South Korea has done well earlier on, lagging a little bit, but nonetheless, pretty satisfactory. And here is a list of Somewhat uh, names of big uh, advanced nations, Israel, Japan, U.S., Sweden, but not very, very well. And Sweden in particular uh, turned out to be a deadly experiment that some people have to be held accountable. So uh, at this point, U.S. citizens are not welcome in many parts of the country, but we started that earlier on. We said we don't want uh, foreigners, and then look where we are. So with that backdrop, you know, I wish I could be saying we're in a better place. This pandemic is going to disappear, as our president says, one day disappear. Uh, but unfortunately, this is here to stay, and we need to practice within this confines of the environment for for a number of years to come. Years, not months. So we need to have a different strategy. So I'm gonna condense my presentation into these three areas. Overall strategy, how should we do it? Uh, PPEs, masks and whatnot, and uh, a little bit about the fogging and HOCL. Uh, some people may not be familiar with this, so I'll spend some time explaining this to make sure. So again, just going back to the principles and the strategies. For the general public, we know this already. Everybody needs to wash their hands, strict social distancing, stay at home whenever possible, 
do only essential type of activities. Uh, we need to go through massive testing and identify who's positive, who's not. And then we do contact tracing to quarantine people. This is a proven and known fact in the public health arena. And again, recently in this contemporary time, shown to be effective in many countries that have shown the results. How do we translate that information to the dental office? We can't social distance, we cannot. We do wash our hands, but we cannot quarantine patients and so forth, it's a completely different set of rules. We have to assume every patient is a COVID positive. Remember earlier on, back in the uh, 80s, when uh, HIV became a big issue, all of a sudden, we had uh, applied this universal precaution concept, which meant everybody that you're encountering is assumed to have HIV positive, something of that effect. Therefore, you did everything to mitigate and to prevent uh, cross-contamination and whatnot. That's what we need to do. Layers of protection in terms of reducing the aerosol, creating barriers with the aerosol and you and your team members and to eliminate the active virus wherever we can. So that's the HOCL. Now, you know, this kind of uh, studies are scientifically based and, and this time absolutely uh, critical that we listen to the scientists and the known facts. So testing. One thought is, if we could identify who is a positive and who's not, that would be beautiful. Now, earlier on, about May, I got tested in May, uh, and it was negative, of course, and we were happy to hear that. But, you know, testing was relatively easy back then. Why? Because people weren't doing it. So the ones that wanted to do it had the first in line. Uh, but right now, it's very, very difficult to get tests all over the United States for a number of political reasons. What you see on the screen is the antibody, anti-body uh, test. And this is actually our team members when we celebrated at the end of May, right before we opened, we wanted to be sure that all of our members were negative. So we took the swabs at, uh, conducted by the County of Los Angeles and we were happy. In fact, Terry and my wife, we actually did drive through. So we all did it together. None of us were positive, so that's all good. But here's an example of readily available uh, and quick, rapid uh, testing. This actually tests for IgG or IgM, whereas the swab actually detects uh, the virus. It detects the RNA by doing uh, uh, CPR, uh, PCR rather, but um, the rapid test uh, is actually a blood test and it's an assay that's done uh, in less than 10 minutes where the blood, diluted blood, when it hits the reagents will indicate whether there is uh, antigen activity uh, that is addressed. So by looking at these shades, you can tell which is positive, which is negative. So, you know, earlier on, people were acquiring these and uh, uh, dental offices were doing this, so did I. And there was a problem. There were too many false negatives and too, too many false positives. So this is our team member, the whole team conducted it. And two people were tested positive out of our group, but it turned out to be a false positive when it was done using the, the, the actual swab method. So I say that is unreliable, and uh, what do you do? If you test a patient, if they do show positive, how do you deal with that? The patient's anxiousness, their uh, you know, medical legal consequences, do you tell them to go back, or do you tell them to part? But it is unreliable because the specificity uh, is too weak. So we assume the patient that's in your chair that you're encountering has the virus. So that means aerosol and splatter will be produced without them wearing a mask. And of course, in dental offices, they have to take their masks off to get their work done. So we know that this is the basic means of transfer of bacteria, of viruses rather, and even these heroic doctors in China uh, and earlier on with the shortage of PPE, we were doing this kind of ridiculous things. Uh, and unfortunately, we could be easily back to this uh, situation, the way things are moving. 
I wanted to introduce this old paper, uh, but quite relevant. It's you know not quite 20 years old, uh, but uh, there was an excellent paper uh, showing what uh, splatter and aerosols are. Aerosol is defined as particles smaller than 50 microns. Splatter is spatter is considered to be uh, particles bigger than 50 microns. So clearly in, um, in the dental environment, we produce both. Now, so spatter and aerosol was tested in a different group. This is a University of North Carolina test uh, study, and a lot of people have referred to this lately. Uh, it's become a very hot paper. Uh, what they did, they actually did cultures, as you can see in a simulated dental uh, uh, operatory. These uh, aga plates were placed in strategic positions, as you can see. It, uh, Comically, some of them were even placed on top of the heads of the operator and the assistant, some ne next to the uh, dental uh, light, some on the tray table and so forth. And the bottom line is when we do an average dental, dental work, be it using piezoelectric scalers, uh, ultrasonic scalers, uh, be it, um, be it uh, you know aerosol producing hand pieces and whatnot, it pretty much uh, ended up showing uh, bacterial growth everywhere. In other words, aerosols and spatter is produced very, very commonly. So this is a paper that dates back to 1994 that made it clear. So how do you prevent it? Well, we need to protect ourselves with PPE. We need to protect ourselves by trying to get rid of most of it. So vacuuming the bulk of it out before it even gets to us is one way. And to produce layers of isolation and barrier is pretty much the known techniques possible. So I'm going to go through this rather quickly. We know that coronavirus can survive in aerosols, not spatter. Spatter is easy to identify, easy to get because they tend to fall to the ground, but they tend to stick to surfaces, then which becomes more manageable. But if they are sprayed into the aerosol, again, by definition, 50 microns or less, we know that they can travel a significant distance. Now, this simulation of somebody coughing uh, can carry at least six feet or so. And again, this is the basis as to why social distancing says six feet. And these are some of the fundamental scientific factors that we know. But what is more alarming is these aerosols do travel, not just between, you know, from the source, let's say the handpiece in the mouth, to your face, but from room to room, from operator to operator, down the hallway, and some of the papers and evidence we have seen in China earlier and in Korea have shown that they travel through air conditioner duct to different floors even. So uh, where contact tracing has been done very seriously in these two countries at least, they have identified people who are positive in one floor of a building and another floor getting the disease, presumably because of the aerosol flow. So we need to have strategies that mitigate that type of uh, transfer uh, in a small dental office. So, um, by now, everybody is open. We have some form. And, you know, that was just a form that I used to inform the patients, uh, our written protocol within our team, and so forth. And earlier on, we pretty much had to buy what we had, uh, make believe, and uh, barriers like this. Uh, and these were readily available everywhere, rather expensive. Uh, but now, uh, this is as of today. Now that we've been at this for a while, um, I've actually had a handyman come in and fit in some glass, so it's a lot more sturdy. My belief is this is not going to go away anytime soon. So now this is like a, a bank teller with a tiny little window at the bottom. Uh, but that way, my team, you know, the, the team that feeds me and my family, I want them safe in this glass chamber with their own air purifier and with having minimal uh, amount of spatter and or aerosol traveling from potentially where the patients come in. 
we now understand uh, this concept of PPE, we need to cover head to toe literally, which was never the case. And, uh, you know, we've been training clinicians in G through GDIA for many years now, and we've may always joked about it. I mean, we want to have a sterile system. We need to duff and don and, and glove up and do all the proper things. But do you want to put some shoe covers, really? Because you're doing surgery in the mouse? but now the game has changed. It's not because something from your foot might end up in a flap, but it's because the aerosol from the source, you know, most likely a patient could end up on your top of your shoe and God forbid you take that home and you spread it to the loved ones at home, elderly, the weak and whatnot, and that is troubling. So now it, it is literally head to toe that we need to cover in, in forms of isolation. So I cover um, respirators, skin and uh, hand and feet are what is expected and is sensible. Now I cover, uh, unless you are in a much more intense situation, uh, the shield is the, the easy answer. So I think most offices have adopted this by now. Uh, I have personally purchased at least nine or 10 different types of shields and tried every one of them on. Uh, and there are some good ones and some not so good ones. So, uh, you know, if somebody needs some advice on that, please personally, you know, contact me uh, by email, text, and uh, other ways. Uh, I also have a lot of uh, unused uh, material that's sitting around because uh, by trial and error, I just accumulated a big inventory of things. So if people want something that, you know, maybe they might find handy that I may not, please, by all means, I, I'm willing to share these. Uh, we used to wear gowns like this uh, made um, tailor-made and used in our uh, operatory for many, many years. And we have our own washing machine we wash, but we realized that the neck is a vulnerable area. So we then, uh, during the lockdown, my wife and I went to the fabric stores all over Southern California, and we actually hoarded all of these materials and eventually made these types of gowns. So now the newer designs have higher neck to cover the neck so you don't have to go wipe your neck every time you come out of the upper tree. And my assistant, my beautiful assistant Alexis, her her grandmother made all of these for us. Uh, so I was very grateful to her for you know doing that service for us. Donning and doffing is a term that we use and again this was not quite familiar with vocabulary a couple months ago, but now everybody is using it in dental offices and whatnot. Uh, it simply means putting on and putting off a, a tire, uh, and there are certain ways to do it. Please take some time to study these. These are readily available, uh, how to do it. You know, maybe some of the recent graduates might have learned it from dental school, but some of us old folks who's been away from dental school for many, many years, please review them and share that with uh, your team members and whatnot. So this is an example of, uh, of, of our uh, setting recently. Okay, let's get to uh, the mask issues. This is a highly contentious uh, thing. And let's talk about, let's put some sense into this because masks are hard to get. Masks, everybody all of a sudden are experts on masks. Uh, you know, people who have never even worn masks or touched the masks are now selling and advising people and brokers and so on. So masks are essential in today's fight against the COVID. Uh, this is a day that we opened that we kind of celebrated with our logo mask uh, that all of us have decided to wear. In fact, we do wear a cloth type of mask in the office throughout the day. It doesn't matter if you know that somebody's, you know, one of our team members is positive or not. We just assume everybody is, uh, has a potential to carry and, and share. So we do that as a bare minimum, the cloth mask. Now, when it gets to what type of mask should I buy, what is the most qualified and you know, what is the right thing to do? This is probably a term that you may not have been familiar with. Uh, Niyoshi, Niyoshi, different people call it different things, but uh, this uh, N-I-O-S-H is an organization uh, within the federal government, uh, CDC. CDC follows up um, on public health measures and disease. NIOSH, N-I-O-S-H, is an occupational safety and health means. So they test 
things on behalf of CDC. So you hear the words CD, uh, NIOSH, or NIOSH certified, or NIOSH approved. But unfortunately today, because of this rather volatile market, there is a lot of counterfeits and a lot of fake certification letters to the point where the government officials are now publishing them and uh, making some announcements as to how we should be careful. Very recently, uh, C uh, CDA, California Dental Association, has stepped in. In fact, if you look at this logo of TDSC.com that you may or may not have come across, this is relatively new. Uh, actually, uh, the Dental Society has started a dental supply company. And uh, if you haven't done this yet, this is an amazing deal. Uh, I just put in my order. This is you know, my order five days ago. Uh, for $40, they are giving out, they say, $700 worth of masks. Uh, but this is one deal per CDA member licensed dentist. So do take full advantage of that as soon as you can. So this is the way we do surgery today. This is my anesthesiologist, uh, uh, Dr. Salman Hussein in the back, and my assistant and myself. Uh, right before we started this procedure, uh, we have the patient uh, going through uh, anesthesia. We have all the setup. I'm not wearing the shield, but I usually do. And uh, yeah, he's not wearing the glass because she was posing for the picture. But the big elephant tusk that you see in the center of the screen is a extra oral vacuum unit, which I will be talking about. So mask is the first layer of a barrier between the source and ourselves. And here you see three different image of uh, different types of masks. And up until this point, you know, I'm sure most of us are in the same boat. When we ordered the masks, my staff ordered, I didn't even pay attention. Sometimes they look good, sometimes I like the color, sometimes I like the brand. That was pretty much you know, our extent of knowledge of the masks because we're all wearing pretty much surgical masks or some people like to call it dental masks. Now we know that there's a different level. There's a level one, two, and three. Uh, level one is pretty much a, a simplistic one. Level two is should be the minimal level for most dental practice uh, under any circumstances. And level three and two, not a whole lot of difference. Level three tends to block out more liquid. Uh, they are right now in high demand. It's very expensive. Uh, the prices went up. I did the research just recently. We used to pay about somewhere between 15 to 20 dollars a box of 50 uh, this time last year right now they are on in the vicinity of 30 dollars or more per box and you know furthermore they're just impossible to get so there's a lot of price gouging we have to bid each other that sort of thing is happening to understand level three and three ply are two different things Three ply doesn't mean anything. Three ply means there's three layers of filter in there, which you could have that at level one mask. But people are using that because, let's face it, the poor assistant who's given the job of ordering says, "Give me the mask. You got to get them now." And she's on the phone, and somebody says, "We're, you know, three somewhere, three ply." Then you say, "Ah, that must be level three. And there are a lot of deceptive sales happening. So three ply is being sold as if they were level three, and the poor person who's ordering might fall for that so be very very careful so this is again you can get a lot of information like this easily online so I'm not going to dwell on the details to understand this is what we're looking at look at the pricing look at the quality uh, look at look to see if they are truly level three versus two versus one and then there's the n95 n95 uh, in, in the shortest time to try to make people understand this the best, let me put it this way. N95 is a respirator. It's the same thing. Mask is, is the same thing, but uh, it's called a respirator. Why? Because it blocks out dust. That was his primary goal. So N95 mask is used predominantly outside of medicine and healthcare. So 
who were the biggest sellers of N95 before this COVID outbreak? Not the, you know, not the medical supply, not the hospitals and the dentists and whatnot. The biggest sales happened at Home Depots and the Lowe's and, and those kinds of uh, occupations and industry. Because painters, people who did grinding and you know, produced dust and so on, were using it in an industrial setting. So uh, be very careful of what you're reading because some of these uh, N95 or KN95, KN95 is a Chinese standard for N95. So it's virtually the same thing, uh, slight differences. Some of these uh, products when you purchase, it will say not for medical use. It doesn't mean you can't use it. It's because of the history and the background as to how these came into the market. Let's think about this. Did a typical dentist, I'm not even going to go to the hospital, okay? I'm not going to talk about the ICU. I'm not going to talk about the emergency medicine. I'm talking about a, the typical dental practice. And let's say you practice a very wide scope. You do wisdom teeth. You do general dentistry. You do a lot of aerosol producing dentistry. The only time you really would have needed N95 prior to the COVID outbreak was when there was a patient in the chair who was HIV positive or identified with some kind of a uh, you know, carrier that you really need to have good blockage of aerosols. That was it. And it doesn't come very commonly, right? So you could have used the N95 every so often, but it was not part of a normal armamentarium or the routine in your practice. Let's say the patient is a true um, you know, carrier of certain types of viruses and you felt very uneasy and you referred the patient to hospital dentistry and the local dental school or some kind of hospital decided to treat them in a different setting. Now those people, let's say Ebola patient, for instance, you know, they wouldn't even use N95, why? Because they go one notch above, one full notch above. So they're in this isolation units, they're literally wearing spacesuits with positive airflow into that. So you don't need a mask under all that. So N95 filled that little void, but today N95 is a big deal. So um, how should I explain this? Bottom line, N95s or KN95s capture 95% of the particles. And uh, therefore, when you wear one of these masks, you should feel like I can't breathe. I am suffocating. That's the normal thing one should be feeling. Um, because these are in such short uh, shortage, uh, the, uh, these devices are out there. You recycle them by uh, putting them through devices like this. Uh, and uh, this is about a $7,000, $8,000 device. I don't, don't know if it's uh, you know, viable financially, but basically all of these N95 or similar respirators need to have fit tested to be sure that it's actually doing the job. So here's the bottom line. It doesn't matter how superior the filters are, how many layers and, and what's in there, you know, uh, molten brown, things like that, fibers, uh, synthetic fibers, these are all layers of things that's built into these fantastic uh, devices to filter out aerosols and particles. But what use is it if it does not seal around your cheek? If there's a gap, if you're, you know, God forbid, if you're sticking your nostrils out, which you shouldn't be doing, if there's a gap around the bridge of your nose, around the side of the cheek, if there's any gap and air is escaping, then what good does that do? So that is the most important thing. Now, there's also valves and no valves, valves that are attached either to the front or the side. In the medical industry, that is not a uh, recommended product. In the, in let's say, uh, in the industrial area, who are you trying to protect? You're trying to protect yourself, the, the worker, from dust and whatnot. Now, in the dental setting, for instance, when the patient is sitting there and you and your assistant is wearing the N95, who are you trying to protect? Yes, yourself. But if you blow out through the valve some air particles, then it's dangerous for all the parties involved. That's why in the dental in industry, you need to have a respirator that does not have a valve. So that's some of the important things. So here is, for instance, a valved one. 
most of these have Naoshi uh, logo and IOSH and 95 and, and the logo of the federal government uh, CDC. Some of these are absolutely true fakes, counterfeits or misrepresentation in some way. They kind of mention, uh, take a look very carefully, it says NOSH, N-O-S-H, it's not even N-I-O-S-H. They're, they're very, very uh, you know, subtle ways to deceive the annoying customer. So some people have come up with uh, quick fixes. You can wear level three mask with a tight seal and it works pretty much as, as close to uh, N95 as possible. So, you know, you can get this online. You can download these templates and basically out of a piece of rubber, uh, you can create these tight fitting uh, gadgets. Uh, if you have a 3D uh, camera, or in fact an iPhone, you can uh, un download the Bellas 3D app and then you can design this uh, uh, mask frame. And uh, I had mine done and mine was printed uh, thanks to Dentist USA. They actually used their, their beautiful printer. Um, and uh, so I did this trial. And of course you use a standard rubber bands to uh, pull this through. So here's a level three mask with a mask fitter and it works pretty much like a N95. So it's a, you know, it's an economical way, quick and easy way when you can't find them or when you don't want to spend that sort of a budget. What is the downside? It hurts. It's very uncomfortable, the elastic. So, I mean, you know, notice I'm trying not to loop this around my ears and I'm trying to have it loop around the back of my head. Uh, this is a, another mask. Uh, that I think Dentist uh, USA is distributing these. Now, a little bit of controversy about this one. I want to make this very clear. If you look at some of these sites uh, by federal government as to what's counterfeit and so forth, this brand actually does appear. And uh, the story is that the distributor of this mask in the United States somehow mentioned Naoshi somewhere, and it wasn't quite the way it should have been. So Naoshi got upset and they kind of like, you know, set this as an example. I believe they resolved that problem. So it's not that the product is, in, you know, not valuable, it does, it's not qualified. Uh, it's just misrepresentation and that became a big issue. Um, I am told uh, the dignitaries in Korea, the president of Korea wears the same mask. So it must have some value. Uh, it is actually being distributed in the US. And the nice thing about this one is, is kind of comfortable. Uh, it is designed in such a way that uh, it fits snugly, so there's minimum amount of escape, and it is the KN95 equivalent. Uh, these are some of the filters, additional filters you can purchase readily to add an extra layer. If you're unsure, then you simply get one of these filters and it has some adhesive on it. You stick it to the inner surface of a mask and you go from there. I've tried everything. I've even bought these. These are called Ninja Shark masks. Uh, I thought uh, this would be an interesting thing. Somebody suggested and I actually bought one. I actually use it when I go diving into my swimming pool. Uh, this, this is so uncomfortable. Uh, it, it, uh, I can't put my loops in it. I can't put my light in it. So it's a concept, but you know, this is okay. But this, this particular helmet has a little bit of a glare underneath. You can see my light under there. It fits. Uh, the one on the right, this uh, less expensive face shield does work. Uh, and we use it from time to time. We've got a bunch of those. Uh, these are uh, rel relatively easy to get. But this is my favorite. Uh, it's the one that has a hinge uh, action, so you can actually tilt it upwards if you want. Uh, and these come with, uh, I should say, I bought this from Amazon. There's about 20 replaceable uh, sh shields as, as it scratches and gets dirty. You toss them out and you can keep replacing it. Fairly inexpensive. So, you know, I think that this is something we can use readily. Cover your heads because there's nothing worse than, you know, viral uh, aerosols sitting on your hair, in between your hair, and you go home, and if you don't take a shower right away, then you might have the potential of spreading it everywhere. So these are the type of things you need to know. So do we need to buy N95? I leave that up to you. Uh, I was able to acquire uh, four different types of N95s. 3M uh, and different brands. And right now I'm at a point where I'm 
you know, circulating and using different ones and different days to, to be able to try to get the best uh, feel and things. The one that you see on the screen, which I think it's called, uh, I don't know if you can see me on the screen here. Uh, this is the one that I like the best. It's a 3M 8210. Uh, if it's very snugly, it is actually what you see on the screen, uh, presentation screen. Um, it is expensive though. To get one of these, it will cost something in the order of seven, eight, nine dollars each if you can get them. Uh, but that's the going rate. So that's enough plug for the mic get masks and what to do. Uh, so let me see if I can answer this one because I'm sure somebody will ask this question down the road. Do you have to wear an N95? No, there's no uh, national or state guidelines by any health care group or authorities who is telling us or mandating that you have to use this type. It is a recommendation by CDC and common sense that you want to use something close to N95, but it is not a law or a mandate. So don't be scared that I don't have enough uh, N95s. Do not be worried. However, I would recommend you do. In fact, if I'm in that situation where I only have 10 masks left, I will give them to my assistants. I will wear a level three. Why? Not that I'm the most generous person, which I hope I am, but the fact is, you know, it's just a, my principle. You, you need to protect your team. That's you know, one of the mandates. You know, when I opened a practice, when I became a dentist, you know, my job was to help patients. But in order to do that, who travels with me and on that journey is my team. My team comes absolutely first. And so their protection is, is to me number one, so they will get it. Uh, but the reverse is true. If the doctor says, well, I only have one left, so I'm using it, you know, the assistants are on their own, you could be opening up to a lot of issues. You could be asking for trouble. Okay, enough said. So the second strategy is to use intraoral vacuum evacuators, and this is called a dry shield. There's isolite. Uh, I've used every one of these, and so far my favorite is this one. Ivory makes relief. It's, uh, it's a cute name. It looks like a leaf. It sits on the side. The only difference is these things offer a bite block at the same time. Uh, pros and cons. This one does not offer the bite block. It just simply is a high volume, not saliva ejector, high volume. So it sucks out at high velocity. So it is therefore getting rid of the aerosol. We don't know how much, but a significant amount. And then uh, there is another one. Oh, I thought I had one, but I don't have the picture. Um, there we go. This is what my se uh, second favorite, Mr. Thirsty. Mr. Thirsty is a relatively inexpensive version of these guys, Isolite or Dry Shield, which are industry standard and they've been around for quite some time. Uh, but Mr. Thirsty is not transparent. So, you know, it, it doesn't have a light source, which is fine for most of the things such as you know, hygiene appointments. Uh, this is relatively inexpensive. You use it once, you throw it away. Uh, when you buy the kit, it comes with so many of these. And then there is a, a high volume saliva ejector, uh, high volume suction adapter. If you haven't done so, put an extra vacuum, uh, you know, line in each operatory. Uh, one of my uh, operatories, I had to bring in the maintenance person and do exactly that earlier on because you need to use a regular high volume for you know routine suction and then one that stays in the mouse pretty much throughout the procedure to minimize the aerosol. So I like this pretty much. Um, most people can handle this bite. So um, you know between the adult size and the children's size, use the children's size for majority of the patients. So there's, there's, you know, that's the intraoral. Now let's talk about the extraoral. Uh, this seems to be the industry standard. Uh, this one is called the IQ Air from Switzerland. Um, these are the offices, some of my colleagues, actually there's a periodontist uh, in, in New York who's installed this on the wall so that uh, for single operators, such as an, a hygienist, they simply use it with one hand and put it away and so forth, so which is pretty handy. In my office, I actually have it on a roller. So uh, this is another colleague of mine who decided to uh, not spend extra money. So they built their own cart, which is a very sharp idea, but this is the original cart that the company sells. Uh, rather expensive, 
but I think it was worth the money. This is a different company. I'm, I don't know very much about it, but I don't. I haven't heard anything positive. Now, this is uh, probably um, <clears throat> another uh, viable option. And, uh, you know, I'm not here to sell anything, but I might as well share the uh, pertinent information. Uh, this used to be around three thousand dollar mark when it wasn't that popular. Now that everybody's demanding it, I think the price went down significantly. So talk to the dentist USA people as they are selling it. Uh, this uh, is just like uh, the other one, uh, the IQ Air, has HEPA filtration. It actually has just dust filtration. And at the bottom, it actually has a UVC, ultraviolet light C type which kills the germs before it exhales uh, the air out of the system. So basically sucks uh, the aerosol, uh, the filter and the HEPA filter will take care of the, the wet aerosol and the dust particles and whatnot. And then it kills uh, you know, possible uh, virus still remaining in the air, which is highly unlikely, and then it expels it out. So that's the way it is. And this is how dentist is selling it. Um, I was able to get one unit, I ordered five, I believe, and one came in early, so I was able to use it the past week. I think uh, the rest of you guys who have ordered will be getting it uh, in a week or so, I'm told. So, uh, you know, you know, get ready for it. I do have a video, but I don't know where I have filed it. I kind of put everything in a hurry, and I took the video yesterday, and I shoved it in, but maybe I didn't do a good job. So I'll look for it, uh, and I'll, I'll share that video of comparing the actual uh, different units later on. So we have air aerosol that's being produced. We want to suck as much of it out right from the source from intraoral. If you miss some of that, extraorally, we want to suck that out. Anything that could still come towards you, namely a face and, and so on, we wear the proper PPE masks and face headgear to protect you uh, from getting direct contact to your skin and your body. Then there's possibly some virus in the aerosol still floating around. What if some just make its way out behind you, between you guys, and end up in the in the next door or or down the hallway or God forbid, you know, somebody waiting in the waiting area? So air purifier makes perfect sense as the next layer of uh, defense. Uh, I've done my research, and in fact. Um, during the lockdown in March, April, May, oh, I belong to a number of prestigious groups, which I'm very, very fortunate to say. Uh, one of the groups, uh, which is called the International Association of Dental Specialists, it's, you have a membership of roughly 300 periodontists, oral surgeons, endodontists, orthodontists, you name it, and uh, a bunch of nerdy people to say no more. Uh, we used to have Zoom meetings every day and twice on Friday. We literally did, and we shared all kinds of information, and most of the information that I'm seeing and uh, sharing is partly from that. And we did research, and we came to the conclusion that the first item here, the Medify, is the one that is the winner. Every one of these are good products. In fact, at my house, and you know, my wife likes uh, different types, so we have a number of different ones. This one's a little more pricey. Uh, this is a much bigger unit. I know a couple of clinicians, colleagues who use this and swear by it, I think it's great, but it's a little bit on the pricey side. Uh, and Dentist also sells a different type of air purifier, uh, and you can talk to the dentist reps about that. Uh, but, you know, for practical purposes, in my office, we stuck to this DC in this Medify. We've had one in each and every room, uh, one large one for the waiting area, one in the hallway, one for the patient operatory, one for the hygiene, one for the kitchen area. So I probably purchased 20 or more of these uh, over the past so many. I don't know if they still do this, but you will get some discounts. Uh, so please contact me if you need to. Uh, we've made uh, some arrangements through uh, the International Association of Dental Specialists. It's probably a moot point because I think when you go online nowadays, uh, they, they offer pretty decent discounts. So these are just literally everywhere, every single area and so on. So uh, I'm just gonna go over this very quickly. Do not waste your money on these UVC lights. Uh, this, you know, kind of looks like a like a wand, and you know, you zap it around, and then magically all the bugs get killed. 
Simple fact, let me state a simple scientific fact. If you can stare at it, it is not doing anything. The real UVC, if you stare at it, you should go blind, say no more. So the ones that they advertise like that do not work. All of these gadgets and so on, it's just a fancy toy, it, they do not work. The ones that truly work are hidden because the potency is so so deadly that in the medical facilities, you, you put them in the ceiling, in, in places where you cannot have direct eye vision. Uh, this is something I'm considering, but I still haven't put it in. Uh, these are used at the industrial level where you have parcels and post, you know, mail and so forth uh, that they run through, you know, buses, you know, and so on. Now, this is a, a thought, uh, handphones, keys, and little small items, what do we do? Well, there are some, some of these UVC containers, chambers, but you can look at the price tag here. I don't know if that's practical. So I purchased these uh, on Amazon and eBay for around 100 to 200, and they work just fine. Uh, so you can put your personal belongings, keys, and whatnot. If you don't want to wipe it down with chemicals, this is one way to do it. Uh, but we have it in the front. We offer it to patients if they want to stick their phone in. But in fact, what we do, we, we actually get the patients to put all of their personal belongings in a plastic bag. As soon as they check in, besides all the routine things we do, such as measuring the temperature, you know, asking the right questionnaires and, and whatnot, and wiping their hands with sanitizers, we tell them, put your handbag and your phone your keys, everything in this plastic bag, we wrap it up and we give it back to them. We tell them you're not going to touch them uh, while you're in the practice. It does two things. One, it stops them from using the phone, which is so irritating, or digging into the bag for a stupid reason. So it, it, it has some uh, other positive aspects. But you know what? We've been doing this for about a month, over a month now uh, that we've opened. We are getting so much compliments because patients are saying, gosh, you guys are really going out of the way to make sure things are safe. And, and you know, Matt, it's a fact. Even today, two people called and canceled. They said, look, I don't know if I should come to the office. And we told them what we do. And, and, and they are very grateful for all the things we're doing. But they still say, you know what, I think I'll come back in safer time, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but you do want to stand out as the office that's caring, the office that's actually doing more than average and doing everything under your powers to be able to keep your patients safe. This is a scene that you have seen over the media uh, a lot lately. What on earth are these guys doing? They are spraying basically uh, bleach solutions, diluted bleach or some form of bleach. Now, this is not the same thing. In a dental practice, we do what's called fogging. We fog, F-O-G. And this is hypochlorous acid. Now, hypochlorous acid is, again, something relatively new to our vocabulary uh, since the COVID outbreak. What it does and what it is. If you want to know uh, what it is, I had this talk with my sister-in-law who, who kind of did a cross-country drive just last week to see our family and they didn't want to fly so they actually drove from Virginia and uh, when they came the first thing my mother told me to do hey when they come you need to go fog them yes mommy so I did exactly that as soon as these kids my my brother my sister-in-law and the two children came in the car we got the fogger out and fogged them head to toe and their car and all their belongings because they've been on on the on the road so what does this do? It's a weak acid. You can swallow some of it. You can, at, at a certain you know, uh, concentration, you can touch it. You can have skin contact, unlike glueraldehyde or other types of ammonia-based uh, disinfectants. This is relatively cool, relatively safe. Why? Hypochlorous acid, if you want to know something, is inside your body. It's a, a mechanism of how your body kills and deactivates some deadly viruses and whatnot inside your body. We generally know that you have some bacteria or some viruses that went into your system. The body takes care of it, the white cells. That's to the extent of at least what I remember from town school. But what it does, it actually deactivates by using this chemical reaction where the acid breaks down the RNA chains. It's a weak acid. And it's a very effective viricide at pH of somewhere between five and six. So these professional cleaners, skin sprays, you know, eye cleaners, 
you know, this is actually, you know, solution to clean and wash your eyes. Very low concentration of hypochlorous acid. Certain types of dental rinses contain that. So, you know, I don't want to get sidetracked, but, you know, these are the kind of things we've actually had in the dental industry. It just never caught our attention, but that's what that is. Hypochlorous acid is very safe, and indeed, uh, the farming industry, the hotels, uh, the cruise ship industry all use a form of this to kill the viruses out there. Now, countries like Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, and so far as Hong Kong uh, have gone through SARS and MERS uh, with a little more deadlier consequence than the United States in the past decade, decade and a half. So many consumers, housewives mainly, uh, have been using these types of things, and they've been testing out, and they've been sharing portals as to which one works, which one doesn't. So we have a lot of information on this. And the way to deliver is to use a fogging device. We need to create equal, just like aerosols. We don't want to create spatter, we want to create aerosols uh, of this material. So let me show you some things from earlier on. Earlier on, I just couldn't get a hold of the proper foggers because they were not, in, so take a look very carefully. This one uh, is actually a, a water spray. Like once you spray this, it just, it's a spatter, it's more than a spatter, it's like a, it's like a water hose, a garden hose. So obviously I wasn't too happy after spending $265, I complained about it, got my refund through Amazon. So stay away from this type. This was the next one up. This one cost a little bit more and I tried the same thing. And I tried to fog my house uh, only to get in trouble from my wife because everything was wet, everything was wet. So we can't do that. Uh, so the foggers that we're talking about is called UVL, and I believe U, ULV, there we go, ultra light volume fogging. This is used in the agricultural industry, in the cleaning industry, industry and so forth. And so far, this one comes out to be a winner, C100 vector fogger. And uh, again, uh, after I started uses, uh, using it and so forth, uh, Dentist USA soon said, uh, if you're using it, we should be recommending it. So they started to distribute this uh, and they do indeed have these. So do contact your friendly dentist reps to, to inquire about that. Bioblasting. Now, these are some of the companies that actually make hypochlorous acid and sell them. So there are three ways so I talked about the delivery system. You need to find one of these fogging devices. And how do you get the hypochlorous acid? There are three ways to do it. One is to make it yourself, which is exactly this one. Do not go anywhere else, but you gotta buy this one. I have no ties, no interest. It's just that this is the most reliable thing I've used. Uh, the price has gone down. This, this used to be $2.99, but now you can get these. And you can get this on Amazon. Once you buy this, they give you the exact formula and step-by-step -step how to make it. We use this, We have. I have four of these. One at home, one at this office, one at that office, and one as a backup. So we use this on a daily basis. There isn't a day that goes by without us using this about, say, five to 10 times, because we create about 500 milliliters each round, which takes about eight minutes. Uh, so, uh, you know, anybody passing passing by is, is job to toss some chemicals in there to make it. Very simple. All you have to do is put some uh, tap water, uh, kosher salt, which is salt that does not contain um, iodine, and some household vinegar and then you pass some electric currents through it, uh, through this device, and it produces exactly the right acidity and PPM. Uh, somebody asked me, kosher salt, and I won't say who, one of the faculties at GDIA, uh, she said, kosher salt, is that a brand? I said, oh my gosh, kosher salt. Uh, so, and then we find that these things, uh, these gadgets were at one tenth of the price. Uh, number one, um, I don't know whether they work or not. I just don't know that. But if they do work, you better test them. So what we do is we actually test the pH and the PPM parts per million. It's got to be around 200 to 500 PPM. It's got to have acidity of somewhere between five to six, six and a half pH. So, and I'm told many of these do not. So stay with the reputable people. 
Now, if you don't want to get into all the technology and, and whatnot, a simple solution is to purchase these dolphin pods. These have been around the US only recently. They just came into the US and the big boys, you know, the Shines and the Pattersons and the Bencos have become the initial distributors. Uh, but uh, I felt that this was a great product. So uh, Dentist USA is now distributing this as well. And uh, I think they just came in. I just got my first batch. Uh, the beauty is you just take these uh, pills, uh, these tablets and throw them in water. And you've got the right, uh, ready, uh, you know, made solution to go. So it's relatively inexpensive to use, simple, and so on. Now, if you don't want to purchase a expensive bobber, which is fine, then use one of these spray bottles that they provide. This spray bottle, there's something special about it. I haven't figured this out. You, when you spray it, it actually produces aerosols, very fine mist, as opposed to a spatter of big big particles of water droplets. So this is ideal. Now in my office, I have all of these. What I do is I use the fogger in the hallway, in the big, big areas, waiting area, in the morning, at the end of the day, and so forth. I didn't mention this, but I actually have air um, pipe uh, in a plumbed air with high pressurized spray guns. These are spray guns that you use as a uh, paint spray. And we use that in each operatory. So we fog each other. We fog head to toe before I come out of the room, go to the next room. That way I don't have to keep changing my attire. So we possibly have some aerosols on my body, on my PPE. We fog ourselves and hopefully deactivate the virus before I go into uh, another room or an to see another patient. But this one, you can use this to fog yourself or the rooms, which takes a lot of effort. You're going to have a very sore arm because you're constantly pumping. But we use this for surface disinfectant because this is very potent and very uh, cost effective. So we use this to wipe down the chairs, uh, uh, the bench tops, uh, and things like that. And we also use this on a paper towel to wipe down, say, keyboards and computer screens and whatnot, because if you fog the computer the equipment, you don't know where those water particles will end up. So that's pretty much what we're doing. Just a few words about the pre-op mouse rinse. Everybody's doing it now. Uh, there is the bleach, diluted bleach, which if you know me, I use it for therapeutic purposes on, on patients all the time. And there's peroxide and then there's iodine. Those are the three that you could possibly use. And I'm gonna cut to the chase. Peroxide seems to be the answer based on these two gentlemen, uh, Peter Nordland and uh, Jorgen Slots. So, uh, you know, everybody has, has shown different effects, but uh, basically that's the winner. I do use diluted bleach for different purposes, but diluted bleach in an upper tree for a, let's say a new patient that just came in and you're doing a screening examination of some sort, you don't want to introduce bleach. You want to make friends, not enemies. So we actually uh, do this for therapeutic purposes later on. But for new patient, um, the peroxide works just fine. Um, iodine, I'm not a big fan because iodine does stain, has a weird taste and so on. But also what these gentlemen have said, which I think is a great idea, is to paint iodine, Q-tip, Povidine, iodine, such as pedidine, in your nostril throughout the day. Why? Because let's say your mask, you don't have the N95 or you have a mask that's kind of leaky and some aerosol have a tendency to go in. Now, let me ask you a quick question. If bacteria, sorry, the viruses go into say the three cavities, eyes, nose, mouth, which would be the most effective route for the bacteria? And you probably know the answer, it's the nasal cavity because possibly if it's unobstructed, it may end up straight to the alveolus and the lungs. So those who have a lot of nostril hair has an advantage here. However, um, one, uh, take one uh, you know, method is to paint the inner surface of your nostril with iodine so that 
if by any chance uh, the viral aerosol is passing through, uh, it could probably get deactivated by having contacts with the iodine. My son, who's in dental school, was in California all the time, and he had to return to New York uh, to go back to studies because his dental school had opened early in July, and he just was not comfortable, you know, being, and, and he was on American Airlines, not good. Delta leaves the middle seats alone, I'm told, but American Airlines doesn't, didn't do that. So he was unfortunately packed in a sardine uh, can type of situation. So that morning, before he boarded the plane, I grabbed him and I shoved all the iodine in his nostril. He didn't like it, but I said, you're going to do it, son. So he painted that and was wearing an N95 mask got on the flight. So that's what we can do to ourselves to and our patients, uh, I'm sorry, patients if they want to, and our staff uh, during uh, encounters in a day-to-day -day activity. I'm happy to share all this material, uh, you know, uh, if I went too fast, but these are the kind of things that, you know, we have. Let me see if I've missed anything. For the sake of time, I'm gonna move on. Yeah, I don't know where the video is. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show you the video because I I was supposed to have done it, uh, but I didn't. So here we go. Here's a video of the uh, COMEX unit, which is the unit that Dentist is distributing. It's set at 12 setting. It is extremely powerful. As you can see, it will suck in things like uh, hot rolls. Uh, it is noisy, okay? But you have the control of taking it from all the way to uh, a 1 to a 12. Let's just compare that to the competitor, which I also have. This is the IQ Air unit from Switzerland. So here are the two units side by side. And the, both of them are very noisy. And you also see this was unintentional, but the unit on the right is Dentist Light. It's a Lubis unit that is used as a camera and a light. So this one has a setting of one to six. So what I did was I put it at a setting of six, which is very powerful and very noisy. And this too does the same thing. If you have a, okay, so you get the idea. They're both very noisy. But you do have to have a filter. If you ever purchase the IQ unit, uh, I don't know if you know this, I actually have a sock <laughs> right there. I have a sock. It's actually a swimming pool filter we fit over the orifice. Otherwise, if gauze and cotton flies in there, you have to open the damn thing up to be able to get those uh, pieces out. So very, very cumbersome. So I hope that helped you understand. Ah, here's another video that I should have shown. Let me enlarge this. So this is what I have in all my operatory. It cost me uh, more than $2,000 to do that. But one day my uh, maintenance gentleman came in. Notice here, we have this uh, uh, plumbed. So we have pretty much a, a air in the corner of the room. I have a air uh, for normal air use. And then I have this. This is basically a spray gun. And we can actually put some chemicals in there, hypochlorous acid, and it's used to fog ourselves before we move out of the room. Very convenient. So I have all three methods. I have that. Oh, in case you're going to be doing that, I do want you to understand this is what happens. Hypochlorous acid, if left overnight, does this. It actually makes the metal components rust because it's acid. So you need to rinse it and clean it out each and every day. I just have to be a nagging mom. I'm constantly nagging my staff, like, did you rinse it out? Did you put, put, pour that out? You know, that's becoming a new routine at the end of each day. So going back to the final few slides that I have, I am more than happy to share all of these with you. Hey, another piece of good news. We have all applied for PPP, and hopefully everybody has gotten their maximum amount and the EIDL loan, E-I-D-L, uh, EIDL loan and the PPP, and hopefully that's sort of giving you some breathing room uh, while you go through some financial stress. Um, this is brand new. This just happened this week. Uh, CARES Provider Relief Fund. Every dentist should apply. 
go onto this website, cares.linkhealth.com, and then put in your tax ID number, your business model, and your NPI, and they will give you a grant. This is basically to offset any of the financial losses by healthcare providers and the federal government, the HHS. Health and Human Services has allocated 175 billion. It sounds like a lot of money, but get in there fast. If it runs out, it runs out because this is open to all healthcare providers, not just dentists. I did that about three days ago. And in the last couple of days, I had people emailing and texting saying, hey, did you do this? So if you haven't heard about this, do it now. Do not waste your time. I've shared this before. Uh, California Dental Association uh, is doing this. Uh, when you look at it carefully, uh, tdsc.com, uh, they say it's about seven to $800 worth of PPEs, including face masks, uh, uh, N95 masks, and whatnot. Uh, I did mention the ear loops. How do you tell a good N95 and a not so good KN95? Take a look at this image. You see, this is not ear loop, this is head loop. The upper loop goes on top of your head, the lower loop goes in the behind in the occipital area. These are much more comfortable, they provide better seal. Uh, the ones that go on the ears, which are the typical KN95s, they're easier to wear, but they do not seal the sides. So that's one key difference that you want to look for. They'll talk about, you know, the cells will talk about, is it FDA approved? Is it NIOSHI? Is it this? I don't think that really matters one way or another. It's only a good quality, but things like this do matter. They will say, mine has this filter, mine has that filter. If it's anything close to KN95 or N95, most of the filtering is adequate. That's my personal opinion. So get in with this before you lose the opportunity. <clears throat> Last but not least, this is dentist new COVID site. I'm told that this will be full release on the 20th, which is just around the corner. When you go in there, all of the products that I've talked about, gee, I feel like a salesperson today, which I'm fine with because this is not to make any money for anybody. And I'm proud to say uh, the company that I work with closely has provided all of these and I had a lot to do with it, I'm gonna say not because they want to make money because they want to help their customers and these these are the vital things that people need i'm going to go through them one by one <clears throat> the str str sterilizer is an air purifier it's rather costly uh, but i'm told that it's a very popular product in korea uh, it actually filters through air and deactivates any potential viruses in the aerosol and in the air dolphin pots i have talked about that's the the tablet that you put into water to create hypochlorous acid, sanitizer, of course. The Air Queen, uh, the mask, the, the you know, people will ask, what is that, N95, KN95? No, it's Korean equivalent of N95. And it's a very good quality. I use it in my own office, and it has a nice seal. It does have an ear loop, though. It does not have the head loop, do understand, but it works pretty well. The On the bottom left, that solution, that's hypochlorous acid. If you don't want to make it yourself, don't want to buy the equipment, uh, you buy these, and this is 300 ppm. If you have 200 ppm, we use that to fog. I, my girls will fog me head to toe every day, five to 10 times, and I'm perfectly fine with it because I'm gonna breathe in some of that, and that's perfectly fine. At 300, it's a little strong. At 500 ppm, we use it for surface dis disinfectants. Now, unfortunately, when you buy these ready-made solution, you cannot control the uh, the concentration dolphin pot though you can because you put the tablet you kind of have to figure out how much water to put in and uh, if you want to know a little bit more about how to control the ph all you have to do is get some uh, ph uh, strips and uh, chlorine strips uh, to be able to measure that yourself and then there's the fogger and then there's the dust collector or the extra oral uh, vacuum unit Gosh, I think I've done my job. So uh, uh, at this point, we will answer questions. Um, Rebecca, if you could take over. And of course, I'm sure, Rebecca, you're going to be talking about several other uh, courses that GDI is running now, aren't you? Yes. Guys, Sorry about the pause, Dr. <laughs> Kim. <laughs> so the first question we do have for you is if you have any opinions on the ozone water. Mm, 
I, I'm not an expert in ozone. I haven't used ozone, so I'm not very familiar with it. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know how effective it is uh, against uh, the virus uh, and whether we use it as a rinse. I just don't have that information, so I would uh, defer that question to somebody else who can give better information. Got it. Next question would be, um, what about the molecular iodine, more potent than povidon iodine, no staining and no bad taste? Yes, I am aware of that. Um, you know, I I just have a bad memory with iodine. Is I, I you know I dropped a drop because periodontists use iodine for a lot of different things therapeutically. But there's one day I dropped a drop on somebody's shirt, and he literally wanted to have his shirt replaced. He wanted me to give him money for the shirt, which I thought he was joking, but he was serious. Since then, I had this sort of like a negative thing about iodine in general. Yes, uh, you know, uh, you know, the bad taste. There are different ways of doing it, more potent. Uh, by all means, by all means, use whatever is most effective in your own practices. Thank you. Next question would be: Are there any strings attached with the CARES provider payment? Not to my knowledge. Uh, it is something that was, um, you know, at the federal level, uh, and um, it was part of this whole CARES, um, you know, uh, package that the Congress had lots of issues with, and it, it's a little late in coming, but finally they've uh, put their acts together, and the Department of Health and Human Services is doing it. Um, my understanding is you can only uh, apply for it, you know, with the valid uh, NPI, and the valid tax ID number. I don't know anything beyond that, but when you go on their site, there's a lot of things written up there, but it is it is a subsidy grant. I don't know what to call it, but it's basically, it's not a loan, it's not PPP. It is money made available to practitioners to offset any uh, financial losses. Good news. <laughs> Next question is, what's the ratio of salt and vinegar added to water? Could you elaborate? Um, that is very specific to that device. Now, if you are a hands-on do-it-yourselfer, you can actually experiment because you, it's a matter of you know passing electrodes through and and make, you're you're just being a chemist. Um, I don't have time for that. I don't have brains for that either. So I simply buy the device, and when you purchase the device, it gives you written instructions. You know, if I can do it, everybody can do it. You just get a certain amount of salt and a certain amount of vinegar, toss it in, plug it in, that's it. So, uh, you know, we, we, we do it so routinely, it's just second nature to us, but that's all the information I can give you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. I believe that is all the questions we have. Oh, actually, we have one more that just sure. came in. And while uh, Rebecca is looking at the question, I believe there are handouts given out. So, uh, you know, you may want to download this before this session is over. So there are handouts on that uh, chat box, whatever that is. Yes. Um, just to clarify what Dr. Jin Kim has mentioned just now, if you look in the drop down panel, there should be a handouts panel. And we have attached four files and they include some of the products that Dr. Kim has mentioned for the PB equipments. And we actually have a lot of questions that came in during this short time. So, <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> so the next question will be, can an independent contractor apply for the CARES package? Oh, I do not know that. I, I just don't know that. Um, <laughs> but if you have a tax ID number and NPI, I would try uh, because uh, when I did it, all they asked for was my address, my NPI, and tax ID number. The first time round, I was so excited. It was late at night, but somebody told me about this. I went in, and I typed it in, and I thought it was done. The next day, I looked to review. Uh, it got disapproved, and then I realized I was off a digit. So I had to redo it, and then it went through. But that's pretty much all they asked for. Got it. And how often do you get staff tested? Very good question. Uh, we officially reopened June 1st. Uh, prior to that, we did open several times for emergencies, but officially we did a soft opening on June 1st and June 15th we sort of opened fully. 
Um, so at the end of May, we had a team meeting and we all decided let's go get tested. At that time, Los Angeles County was offering free. No questions that anybody could come and do it. Right now, uh, you have to have symptoms or you have to work in nursing facilities or you've actually had, had to have contacts with somebody who is positive. Those are the sort of criteria as to, as to how who gets screened. Even with that, it's very hard to get the appointment and so forth. So the other avenue is to use your medical insurance if you have that and, and seek that avenue. So we are trying very hard, but it's been tough because appointments are limited. Uh, some of my staff don't have medical insurance. So ideally, every two to three weeks, we should be getting tested. I mean, it's, we owe it to ourselves and our patients to do that. Unfortunately, the, the environment isn't such. Um, so, you know, God forbid, you're walking around positive, not knowing it, you know, symptomless, and you could be spreading, you could be a, what, what they call the super spreader. Not a good word, you know, if, if you get identified, dentist, uh, you know, dental office in such and such area has become the super spreader who spread 300 patients with COVID, that's not what you want to hear in the news. Thank you. The next question would be, can you use the tablet's form of hypochlorous acid to fog yourself or patients? Uh, yes, um, when you use the dolphin pod, uh, again, read the instructions very carefully. And depending on how you play around with it, you can do it at about 200 ppm and 500 ppm. The acidity does not change, okay? You do have to buy chlorine and pH strips. Those are easy to buy. You just you know go online and you purchase them uh, and uh, you dip it into the solution to be able to see that it's the right concentration and the right pH. So long as the right uh, concentration, you can use to fog yourself. If you're at about 200, perfectly fine. If you're at about 500, uh, use it for different purposes, uh, but you make basically you make two different solutions if you're using using dolphin pod. Thank you. Dental schools such as UCSF and UOP are requesting patients get tested prior to their appointments involving aerosol generating procedures. What's your opinion about this on private clinics? I think it should be. Uh, you know, um, and there's no correct an way to answer it. In principle, that should be the case. Remember, uh, Arizona opened May 1st. I was very, very concerned personally because they were one of the first states to open up and they were opening amidst a very, very peak. They were sort of climbing and I said, that doesn't make any sense. But the governor of Arizona stated the following things. You need to have adequate PPE, fine. Uh, you need to test your patients and your team members to be not positive. I said, how are you going to do that? Because at that time, that was not possible. You just could not get tested. So now times have changed. And in, in theory, we should be doing that. We should all be tested. We should be testing the patients. Right now, the problem is if anybody gets tested, the result won't come back for a week. So then how do you counter for the fact that during that time of waiting, you could have contracted the virus, you or the patient. So right now we're in a very, very awkward situation. That's exactly the concept of contact tracing, which is a principal public health uh, methodology. And some of you may not know this, but I do have an MPH behind my name. I've done a master of public health at UCLA many years ago, so I know a little bit about this. And uh, you know, this country, unfortunately, does not seem to be abiding to those uh, basic rules. Uh, so testing is a big problem. It is a problem, but I think it should be. I think it ought to be. Thank you. The next question is, can you explain the COVID testing? What is considered a positive? If you have antibodies for the virus, are you considered an active spreaders or an immune person? That's a good question. You know, when when you hear about the positivity rates uh, of a certain state and the numbers rising and so forth, we're talking about the actual test swab is, is another word given to look for the virus. So when somebody says I tested positive, they have the virus in their body uh, based on the, the PCR uh, test. The antibody test does not 
tell you that there's virus in your system. It tells you that you have reactions and you've built some antibodies. Now that is the thing that uh, is being talked about amongst the immune, uh, the, the vaccine uh, people. How much, how much antibodies do you have to develop to say that the vaccine is working and you are immune to it? We don't know that. So, you know, when I tested positive to the antibody tests when I first did, I said, this could be good, this could be bad. You know, it could mean that I truly am contracted, which got, you know, thank goodness it wasn't the case. But if that meant that I was exposed and I didn't have symptoms and perhaps my body built the antibodies, which I want to believe, then I may have some immunity. So that's the way to interpret but can you use that as a reliable measure to sort people out? I can see you, I shouldn't see you. You tested positive on anybody, so you quarantine yourself, don't report to work. Can you actually do that? I say no, they cannot. So no uh, authorities are using that test. That test is being used for different purposes, not for screening. So when we say we need to be tested, the country needs to improve the test, we're talking about the swabs, not the antibodies. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Kim. I believe that is all we have for tonight. Um, thank you, Dr. Kim, for your valuable share of knowledge. We thank everyone for joining us for today's session this evening. Safety is our greatest priority, and we here at GDIA hope for everyone's safety and good health. Um, furthermore, we do have some quick announcements. I believe Ellie will be sharing my screen. There we go, thank you so much for the for the wait. Um, so furthermore, we do have some quick announcements. Next Thursday, we will be hosting our second webinar series, Implant Reconstructions Based on Physio Physiological Occlusion. It will be taking place over the course of four total sessions. The first session will begin next Thursday, July 23rd. This webinar series will be covering implant prosthetic concepts covering occlusion, fundamental, intermediate, and advanced topics. Originally an in-person course program, we have converted it into a webinar version due to its popularity. For a small fee of $199, we ask for your strong interest and participation. Therefore, if interested, please register for this webinar at webinar.gdia.com. Furthermore, if you ever miss out on our webinars or ever wanna go back for review, you can get full access to all our GDI webinars by simply becoming a GDIA member please reach out to a GDI representative at info at gdia.com on how to become a member. We hope you found today's session valuable and we look forward to your continued participation. Thank you and we hope you all have a great week.